Thank you, Beth. Good morning. It's so good to see you in God's house this morning, especially when there are so many in our church family who are sick with COVID or bronchitis or the flu. I thought I was going to need to come out and recruit some of you to come join the choir this morning, but we're glad to see all of you here in worship. Would you stand as we sing together? it is to gather in your house this day. Lord, we pray that we will be able to leave this place echoing these words with which we begin worship today, saying, it is well 
with our souls because we have been in your presence this day. And so, God, we ask your blessing on all that we do this morning in this time of worship, Lord, that you might speak to us through word and song and all that we do, that we might go from this place saying, oh, yes, it was good to have been in the house of the Lord. And it is in your name that we pray these things. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. It is good to see you this morning. Good morning. Glad that you are here. Glad that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. A couple of things to draw your attention to. This week, our, our Wednesday night offerings for adults will be a little bit different. Um, the Fair family, our missions, pro, our missions partners in Alaska, um, are going to be with us this Wednesday night. They're actually going to be here Tuesday and work with our, or be with our children for their Tuesday night activities. But they're going to be here Wednesday night at 6, um, giving an update on their ministry and their things that are going on with them in Alaska, maybe opportunities to partner, to continue to partner with them. Um, so that is what is going to be going on for adults on Wednesday night. The adults will meet as one group in the craft room. One group in the craft room on Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday evening at six o'clock to hear from the fairs. I hope that you will be with them, you will be with them, that you will hear um, and get that update on what is going on with some of our missions partners. Um, you, are, you are hopefully aware, hopefully you know, we are finally, the youth, going on retreat next weekend. We have 46 students and 10 adults, college students, something like that. I'm starting to lose count, which probably isn't a good thing, but it's been a while we've been planning this trip. So we are excited, we are ready to go. We covet your prayers. As, uh, as I know, you have already been in prayer for this trip. We hope that you'll continue to pray for us as we go next week. If you would be interested in, in giving us something in addition, um, we would also covet your snacks. So if you would like to send, us, send something with us on the trip, just talk to me. I can let you know what we need and what we could take with you. But I hope you'll be in prayer for our students for this great weekend. You'll also see in your bulletin, mark your calendars, Thursdays in March. Thursdays in March from 5.30 to 7, we'll have pickleball set up in the gym. Um, so if you, if you are a pickleballer or if you've heard about it or if you have no idea what's going on but you heard the word pickle and you're interested, come with us Thursdays in March, 5.30 to 7. Um, we'll be playing pickleball in the gym through our recreation ministry. All ages, all skill levels, are invited to join us. Um, I'll also remind you as we move closer and closer to Easter, um, Elizabeth needs eggs. Last year, due to adjustments we made for COVID, everyone took their eggs with them after the Easter egg hunt, which means we need to replenish our stock. So if you would donate eggs, we use about 2,500 eggs um, for that Easter egg hunt. So if you would help us make a dent in that, we would appreciate it. You'll see a lot of other things going on in the life of our church. We are excited as we move into a busy spring season. And so as we will now continue in worship this morning, I hope you'll take opportunity, pass the pew pads around so we can keep records, so we can know you're here, so you can give prayer requests if needed. It's a joy to worship with you this morning. Remember the Lord is me. 
Dear Heavenly Father, for the gift of this day, we give thanks. Father, its beauty is because you have created this day. And Father, you are present with us in this day. And Father, by your love and mercy and grace, Father, you have provided everything that we might need for this day. And so, Father, as we remember that, we pray for your blessings on these tithes and offerings, that they might be used to, in, to spread the incredible news of your amazing love for us throughout this community and in this world. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
as we, we come to the time to say our prayers, you will notice in your bulletin an announcement about prayer, a prayer chain for our pastor search committee. That announcement ends with these words from James 5, 16. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Last week, we had a time of commissioning for our pastor search committee. They've been hard at work for a number of months, but they're entering a, a new season of discernment as they talk to candidates and so forth. And so we commissioned them. Now, the request is, would you pray? And would we have a prayer chain so that in 15-minute intervals, all during the day, from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m., if we can have that many times filled in, we are praying for the pastor search committee, for candidates they may be talking to. You see the announcement there. You can call the church office this week to sign up for a time. There will be a, a board next Sunday where you can fill in and sign up for your name. But as we begin saying our prayers, I invite you to think about how you might pray in this important time of transition in the church, how you might pray for the pastor search committee and the process that they are doing. So, now let's say our prayers together. Would you pray with me? Loving God, we lift up prayers of praise and adoration for your greatness we see all around us, for your goodness, for your grace that we see as gifts to each one of us. And so we come to worship you on this day, offering our lives our songs, our prayers, our gifts, all that we are in response to all that you have given to us. We pray for our church, oh God, praying specifically for the pastor search committee and the whole pastor search for pastoral candidates who don't even know about your touch upon their lives yet, but who will soon be in a time of discernment. Oh God, we pray for your wisdom to be shared and for your will to be done. And then help all of us as a church to join together in this intense season of prayer. We pray not only for the pastor search committee of our church, we pray for the youth weekend, the youth retreat that's coming up next weekend. We pray for all those who are going that lives will be changed, that minds and hearts will be expanded, that the good news of Jesus will make a difference in the lives of the youth and the leaders who are there. Oh God, our prayers also go out for this church, for good number who are ill during these days. As COVID continues with its movement through the community and the world and other illnesses, we pray for your healing to come for all who are not feeling well. Even as we pray for our church, oh God, we pray for the world, not just for us, but for all the world. We pray for peace when war is being threatened. We pray for calm when violence emerges. We pray for wisdom by our leaders. We pray for our world. You love this world enough to send your only son to die for us. So we ask that you now Bring healing in the world, in our lives, and that you restore your peace. Oh God, we're all on a great journey of life and faith. 
We fail, we sin, we break your commandments, and so we offer the confession of our lives as we confess our sins to you and we pray for your forgiveness and we ask that you restore us into a right relationship with you. And now as we open up your word, teach us and help us to hear and listen and then live the great words of truth that we read. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today is the third week of a message series that I've just simply called Journey. Life is a journey. We're all on it. But when we look at the Old Testament, we can understand the Old Testament as three great journeys. And so we've tried each week to take one episode out of each journey. The call of Abraham is God called Abraham and Sarah to go to a land that was a land of promise, a land that would be shown to them, and a great nation would come forth. And they would be a blessing to others. Last week, there was the great journey out of slavery and bondage in Egypt back to that promised land, and we heard from Moses. And then today, the third big journey in the Old Testament, the exile journey, in which the same Hebrews, these same people of God, had been taken from their land into Babylon for a time of exile of many years, and then they were preparing to go back home. So, our passage for this week, an episode in this exile journey, it comes from Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40. I'll, I'll read the first part of the first verse that says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. And then we'll go down to verse 28, right at the end of the chapter, to see what this comfort is all about. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The Lord speaks comfort. Comfort my people. These are words that we all need to hear right now, aren't they? In a church during a season of transition, waiting for a new pastor, wondering when that will happen, we need words of comfort. In a world that's just now trying to emerge from this pandemic, and we're going on two years, we need words of comfort. In a family that may have just heard bad news from the doctor, we need words of comfort. In a country where ideological and political divisions just tear apart at the very fabric of our society, we need words of comfort. And in a world where warfare and terrorism abound, and we need Words of comfort. The list could go on and on. And we hear these words from Isaiah 40, verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people. Isaiah 40 begins a new section in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 40 is the time where the people of God 
begin to make the turn toward thinking about going home. They have been in exile. The journey they have been on is this turbulent journey that has taken them from their homes and then placed them in a land where they don't want to be. But now there's hopefulness. There's the possibility of going home. They're not there yet, but they're turning and they're hearing this word from God, comfort. There's something in these words for us. There's the lessons of Almighty God speaking to us who might need to hear these words of comfort. In fact, they speak to us, especially if we are in exile. Now you might say, exile? I've never been in exile. So let me ask, have you? Have you ever been in exile? And when you think about it and read the Bible story about, you know, being carried away into Babylon, probably not. But when you think about exile is when we live in a way, in a place where we don't want to be. A lot of us have been in exile. It may not be a geographical place, but it may be a, a condition Our health may put us in exile where we're living where we don't really want to be. Our job may feel like we're in exile where we're we're forced to do what we really don't want to be doing. Many of us, if we thought about it that way, would say, well, yeah, I know what it's like to be in exile. Living where we don't want to live. Not just geography, but all of life. Have you ever been in exile? And so in exile, these wonderful words come, words of comfort, comfort my people, God says at the outset of the chapter, but then at the end of the chapter, the explanation of how this comfort is going to come, it it is given there. And that's where we want to look today. Verses 28 and following What is God saying to us in case you're living in a a way, a place, a condition where you don't really want to be right now and you feel like you're in exile? What is God saying to you from this passage as we all make this journey through life? Hear these words from verse 31. But those who hope in the Lord. But those who hope in the Lord. Now, I was reading from the NIV uh, translation of the Bible. Others of you may know or may have learned or memorized this as, but those who wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Either one. So what does it really mean to hope in the Lord or to wait upon the Lord? What is he talking about here? Especially when we think about waiting, (laughs) who likes to wait? I mean, anybody? We we live in a world where we want everything instantly. We want uh, communication to happen instantly. We want our gratification instantly. I, I don't meet many folks who just want to wait. And then we hear this word, but those who wait upon the Lord. So let's go back to the Hebrew word there. That word that's either translated wait upon the Lord or hope in the Lord, it it literally meant to twist or to wind. Think about it like a rope. You have the different fibers that are twisted together, that are wound together to make a rope, okay? So sometimes we think waiting on the Lord, that just means, you know, we sit around and do nothing and are passively waiting. Let's go to the meaning of the word. It means to twist or to wind. Let's put a picture in our mind of a rope and a rope that connects and our lives that are connected like a rope to God. So think about it. If you're 
If you're skiing, you, you need some kind of rope, some kind of connection to the boat. If you're stuck in a ditch and you need to, to be pulled out with a, a, a truck, tow truck, there's some kind of rope or chain that pulls you out. If you're drowning and someone throws you a life preserver, it'd be great if there was a rope on that where they could also pull you in. So this word is really the idea of a rope, of being wound together, twisted together with God. So think of it like this. For those who hope in the Lord, for those who wait upon the Lord, that means for those who have chosen to connect their lives and wind their lives together with God in such a tight way. Okay. That might make a little more sense than just waiting and doing nothing for those who connect their lives like a rope, twisted, wound together tightly with God. But let's keep going. For those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Will renew their strength. And one more uh, word picture from the, the Hebrew. That word renew, it literally means exchange. Exchange. We'll exchange their strength. It's, it means, to go back to those illustrations I had earlier, if you're skiing and you're connected to the boat with that rope, you exchange your strength for the power of the boat. Or if you're stuck in the ditch in your car and you're needing to be towed out, you not only are connected by that chain, but you have exchanged the immobility of your car for the one that's going to pull you out. Or if you're drowning in the water and you're needing help and you grab the life raft, boat and life preserver, that's the word I want, and you grab it and someone pulls you in, then you're exchanging your floundering, drowning weakness for the strength of someone who's pulling you in. Are you all ready to go to the beach yet? I am. About had enough snow, it's time to go to the beach. So when I go to the beach, I, I love watching what people do. There are all kinds of things they do, and, and I, I love watching people who paddle board. I don't know if we have any paddle boarders, but you know, they get out there, and it looks cool. I don't ever want to do it, but it looks cool. And they're on the paddle board, and they're sort of paddling along. And I saw that, and it, that looked nice. And then, then I saw windsurfers. Who, who still were on a board, but they had a sail sort of thing on that, and they were just whoosh, jumping the waves and going fast, and that looked a whole lot more fun. Not that I will do that either. But the difference was the paddle boarder was getting by on his or her strength, only themselves, and that looked pretty hard. <laughs> especially as the, the waves were there, whereas that wind surfer exchanged their own power for the power of the wind. And with that, they were able to take off. Well, that's exactly what's being described here. So those who hope in the Lord are those who connect, almost like a rope tied together, connect to God and the power of God. And then... And then they exchange their own life with all of its frailty and weakness for the power of God. And that's why I've called this the exchanged life. It really comes from a man named Hudson Taylor, who was a missionary in China in the 1800s, founded the China Inland Mission, famous Chinese missionary who who talked about the great exchange and the exchange life that 
when we live as Christians, we don't just live on our own power, we exchange it for the power of God. So God is saying to the people who are hoping to go home, who are in exile, who have been living where they don't want to live, if you will connect your lives to me in such a way, just like a a rope tied tightly together, then I will renew your strength, meaning we're going to exchange your weakness for my strength. And that will allow you to live as you've not lived before. And how does that described? There are three beautiful examples that are given. Verse 31, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Those who connect like that rope will exchange their strength. And here's what's going to happen. First of all, they will soar on wings like eagles. Now, we talked about this a little bit last week in the image from Moses, the image of stirring the nest and flying as eagles as we had our flight training last week. And there are those times in life that are filled with ecstasy, when life is going great, when we understand and feel and experience the goodness of God, and we want to praise God and celebrate, and we soar like eagles because we're ecstatic. And we can all point back to some times in our lives where we just felt like we were soaring as eagles. But then the second example that's given for those who connect their lives and exchange their power for God's power, not only are we able to soar with wings like eagles, the second thing is they will run and not grow weary. Maybe this isn't the ecstasy of just soaring like an eagle, but it is the energy that comes when God empowers us. We're able to run and not grow weary. We're able to do what God wants us to do as individuals, as a church, because we're energized and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And then the third promise. They will walk and not be faint. They will walk and not be faint. So sometimes we can't soar on eagle's wings. And sometimes we can't even run with great energy. But in those times, we're given strength to walk and not faint when we will connect our lives so closely to God, when we will exchange our power for God's, then then we will be given this strength not to faint, to walk and not be faint. Have you ever experienced that in your life? Where life was tough and things were hard and challenges were in front of you and you weren't sure how you were going to make it? You may have wondered this in the hospital room or in the funeral home, or you may have wondered it as you face the challenges of life. How am I going to make it? And yet as you look back, you were able to see that God gave you the endurance to keep on keeping on, the strength not to faint. And some of you would say, I didn't have I didn't have power on my own. I made it because of a greater power that was given to me. The exchanged life. The strength not to faint. Well, the Winter Olympics has just closed down. Let me tell you my favorite Olympic moment. Summer Olympics, 1992. The Olympics in Barcelona, Spain. I don't know if anybody saw this or has read about it since. 400 meter race. Britain's Derek Redman was running in this race. Good chance to win a gold medal. He had been injured in the previous Olympics, so he had waited a long time for this moment, and he was doing well, excited, ready to go, made 
the race. He was in the race, doing well, and all of a sudden, he pulled up with pain in his leg. Down the back stretch, a torn hamstring, right there in that great Olympic race where he had, had longed for, trained for, you know, all of these years had gone toward just those few moments out on that track, and he pulled up, collapsed, and just by a force of sheer will was able to get up and, and start hobbling to the finish line. Everybody had long since passed him. But the amazing thing was that right then his father, Jim, up in the stands saw what had happened. And somehow his dad evaded some security guards and got out on the track and came up to his son and put his arms around him and said, come on, son, let's finish this together. And you may have seen pictures of Father Jim wrapping his arms around his son who can just barely walk and is limping like this, and they made it together. Not because Derek the athletic runner was so strong, but because his father came along and Derek exchanged his limping legs for the stronger legs of his father. And they made it to the finish line together. That's the exchanged life. That's the promise that God offers to us. This promise of a life that can bring us comfort. Because there's some times that we can soar on wings as eagles. There's some times that we can run and not be weary. And then, then there are some times that God comes and strengthens us and we exchange our weakness for the strength of God and we are able to to go forward. I can't preach on this passage without remembering one of the most memorable sermons I've ever heard. I was junior high. My pastor, a man named John Claypool, preached on this sermon. And he called it the strength not to faint. In the background, his daughter, my friend, young nine-year-old at that time daughter, had leukemia. She was battling this, and she had had a setback on Easter Sunday, and out of all of that tremendous pain and struggle and the first sermon back, my pastor John preached on this text, and he commented um, about the order of these three promises. Let me just read what he said. Now, I heard this sermon, you know, sitting right behind the Lindleys over there, and I'm listening to this, and I'm thinking about all of this. Here's what he said. Some people feel that the sequence of this Isaiah passage is all turned around. And that the highest form of God's help ought to be the soaring of ecstasy. They say it should read, first you walk, then you run, then finally you mount up with wings as an eagle. But I think the writer knew what he was doing when he set down the promises as he did. For in the dark stretches of life, the most difficult discipline of all is not that of soaring or even of running. It consists in keeping on, keeping on. When events have slowed you to a walk, when it seems that in spite of everything you're going to crumple under the load and faint away. Well, that is how it was. And here I am this morning, sad, brokenhearted, still bearing in my spirit the wounds of the darkness 
I confess to you honestly that I have no wings with which to fly or even legs with which to run. But listen, by the grace of God, I am still on my feet. I have not fainted yet. I have not exploded in the anger of presumption, nor have I keeled over into the paralysis of despair. All I am doing is walking and not fainting, hanging in there, enduring with patience what I cannot change but have to bear. This may not sound like much to you, but to me it is the most appropriate and most needful gift of all. My religion has been the difference in the last two weeks. It has given me the gift of patience, the gift of endurance, the strength to walk and not faint. And I am here to give thanks to God for that. Some of you need to hear that word this morning. Because life is pretty tough right now and you're wondering... You know, I don't feel like soaring like an eagle. Not sure I feel like running. But the good news is that when we connect our lives and wind them with God like a rope, and when we exchange our weakness for God's power, then the great promises come. And maybe the greatest is that God gives us the strength not to faint, to keep on keeping on. So that one day we can have the energy to run and not grow weary. And one day we may soar on wings as eagles. But right now, the greatest gift is the one that God offers to us. If we will hope in the Lord, then our strength will be exchanged. And God's comfort, comfort will be given to us. May that be true for you and for me. Let's pray about that. Oh God, in this journey of life, some of the days are pretty rough. Sometimes we feel weak We need the strength that only you can give. And so, take us back to these great words from the prophet. May we hear them, may we learn them and live them. And through them, may we find your peace and comfort. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is number 66, Day by Day. Day by day, God walks with us, gives us strength, gives us hope, gives us life, day by day. Are you ready to make that first step, that journey with God? Are you ready to say, I want to trust in Jesus and follow Him and be baptized? I want to exchange my weakness for God's power. I want to live this exchanged life. If that's a decision you're ready to make, come tell us about it. Are you ready to move your membership into this church family, feeling that here is a place where we can make this journey together and we can strengthen one another as God strengthens us? I'll be right here at the front. We'll sing number 66. I invite you to come and share your decision. Would you stand as we sing together?
you. Would you be seated for just a moment? Why don't you come stand with me? So, I am excited to share with you the information that Allie Martin has come to profess her faith in Jesus Christ and saying that she is ready to be baptized. Now, she has been nurtured in the life of this church and in the, her family, um, Neil and Kimberly Martin, her parents and grandparents in the church, Steve and Julie Hobbs, all kind of family connections here, but she is part of, of our family. And I want to say to you that I'm so excited that you have made this decision. And on behalf of the church, I'm going to shake your hand, all right, to say that we rejoice with you and will help you to continue to grow as you follow Jesus. So look out here. If you join with me in rejoicing that Ali has made this decision, and if as a church you will pledge to help her as she continues to grow in the faith. Would you raise your hand? Say amen. 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 All right. I'm going to ask you to stand right here. Uh, we can get family down here during the benediction. Why don't you all just slip on down? And would you take a moment on the way out to come and rejoice with them and offer your words of blessing to Allie? And soon there will be a special time of baptism where we can celebrate again. We have worshipped God together in this place. Now we go to serve. And so, as we go, I invite you to stand and prepare your heart to go and live the exchanged life that God offers to all of us. Christ, go before you to prepare a way of service. Christ, go behind you to gather up all of your efforts for His glory. Christ, go beside you as leader and guide. Christ, go within you as comfort and stay. Christ, go beneath you to uphold with everlasting arms. Christ, go above you to reign as Lord Supreme. Amen.